Uh, we will start with a, a, a tour of the different uh, discovery sites. Uh, you will see that the Dead Sea Scrolls is not one archive, it's not one collection, uh, but it's composed of uh, a lot of different uh, things found in different uh, discovery sites. And then we will talk a little bit about what are the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of you, I'm sure, have heard about them before uh, and know a little bit, and I will kind of uh, try and uh, give, uh, uh, and I will try and give you the view of the whole um, collection that uh, we have. Then we will talk about the discovery of the scrolls, how, it, we, when were they found, how were they found, and how did they get uh, here to the Israel Antiquities Authority. And then we have time uh, in the end, and we will talk about the Israel Antiquities uh, Authority's um, uh, actions for the conservation and the dig digitization of the scrolls and how we use today's technology uh, to bring the scrolls into the 20th century. So uh, we will start from our most uh, northern uh, discovery site. Uh, we call it Badi Dalia. It's not actually in the Dead Sea Shore, but it's in the, or in the Judean Desert. Um, in this site, uh, the archaeologists found in the 1960s approximately 40 uh, papyrus uh, documents dated to the 4th century BCE. The scholars today think that these uh, documents uh, belonged to uh, the rich Samaritans that fled from the soldiers of Alexander Mokdon in 324 BCE. So this is our most ancient uh, collection. There are about 40 of them. They're written mostly in uh, Hebrew and uh, some in Aramaic. And it's mostly a, 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 a deeds of a sl a slave sales. We're going uh, in the chronological order. So we went from Vadidalia from the fourth century, and we're going ahead in time into the third century BCE and until the first century CE. I'm talking about the Qumran caves. We will talk later about the different uh, scrolls that were found over there and how they arrived uh, to us. We know that it's not only one cave, we're talking about 11 caves that were found near the site of Qumran on the shore of the Dead Sea. Our next uh, discovery site is Masada. Masada is very interesting from a lot of different reasons. A part uh, of the story of Masada itself, it's the only excavation site that the scrolls were found not inside caves, but inside the ruins uh, on the mountain itself. Uh, they belong to the first, to the uh, big revolt at the first century CE, just after the destruction of the second temple in the year 72-73. What's also interesting about the site is that the, the scrolls that were found there were not only, uh, not only belonged to the Jewish uh, rebels, but also to the Roman soldiers, and they were all found together in the same uh, place. Our next discovery site is what we call the Balkochva refugee caves, dated to the second century uh, CE from 132 to 135. In these caves, they were found a lot of personal uh, belongings that belonged to the uh, refugees themselves, the hid in these caves in Vadi Murabat, Nachal Khever, and Nachal Selim. And together with these personal belongings, they found a lot of archives um, uh, that were kept over there for, over, for almost 2,000 years. Some of these documents are personal documents, um, and some of them belong to the logistic um, administ and, and administrative of, uh, of the Balkochva uh, revolt itself. We will talk about the content uh, later. Our latest uh, discovery site is dated to the 6th until the 8th centuries CE. Um, it's between the Byzantine and the early Muslim uh, periods. It's called Khilbet uh, Mild, Holkania, uh, an ancient monastery where in one of the underground uh, rooms they found over a hundred um, documents written in Arabic, 
uh, and also in uh, Latin, in Greek, in Syrian, and in many other languages. Uh, these manuscripts have not yet been properly published or um, examined. We are working on it uh, today with different scholars. So here's a small summary at what we've seen until now. So you could already see that we're not talking about one site. It's not, you know, usually when they say the Dead Sea Scrolls, people you know, say Qumran. So Qumran is indeed our largest collection and it's uh, the first one that was found. And it's the one that um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are famous about, but it's not the only one. And the others are important uh, as well. You could see here a few of the fragments that were found. You could see the different uh, materials, different languages. You look differently. And that brings us to our next topic about what, what is actually written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And from that, we could also learn why is it so important to us and why is it considered as the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. About a third of the manuscripts are what we call biblical manuscripts. The Dead Sea Scrolls have um, all of the, of the Hebrew Bible, uh, all of the books of the Hebrew Bible in many copies, except of the Book of Esther. Uh, the books that are mostly, that are the most common is Genesis, uh, Psalms, and Isaiah. But like I said, we have all the different copies. Now, some of these uh, biblical scrolls are identical to the uh, Bible that we have uh, today, and some of them represent uh, other uh, versions of the Bible. Some of these versions have been known uh, to the scholars, and some are new, and some also um, fall in between uh, these different uh, categories, which tells the scholars that in, in the Second Temple time, before the canonization of the Bible, um, there was a little bit more room for a personal, not, not personal, but there was more room for a interpretation of the text and different versions uh, was something that was actually um, uh, common in, the, in that world. Now, when these, the scrolls were found, the most ancient Bible was from the 10th century CE. So even here, you could see how the, the scrolls predate what we knew from over a thousand years, um, except of the two uh, books that we see over here from the 10th century. We have the uh, Aleppo, uh, the, the uh, Cairo, Agnesa from the 8th, 9th century. But on the whole, these predate um, the, what the scholars knew at that time uh, for almost a thousand years. The second category is what we call the non-biblical manuscripts. We have parabiblical texts, a Heims, Kres, and Wisdom texts. Now these uh, scrolls that I show you over here uh, were considered as religious writings and sacred, not only to the people who wrote them, but to the entire Jewish, uh, to the entire Jewish religion of, of that time. But they did not get into the Bible as we know it uh, today. Some of them we know from um, from ancient from from early uh, Christian communities, the ones that are more isolated, uh, like in Ethiopia, and some uh, are totally new for us. But we do know that they were considered as uh, sacred for the whole Jewish uh, religion of that time. The third category is what we call the Sakatarian text. These are also religious writings, but they were not uh, considered as religious for the whole Jewish um, uh, religion, but specifically uh, to the fact that wrote them. Um, I will not talk more about the Sakatarian manuscripts because in two weeks, my colleague, uh, Dr. Oren Edelman, will have a, a session about who wrote the scroll and what we know about them. And we have the fourth category, documents, letters, uh, logistics, and all other uh, documents, mostly from papyrus, that kind of give us a peep into uh, the personal life of these people 
and uh, and we can learn a lot from these documents on the relationship between the Jews, uh, mostly the Roden, to the administration that was on top of them. Another little summary, we have most of our scrolls are written in Hebrew, a Hebrew that uh, some of you can perhaps uh, read and some of you can't. In Hebrew, we can write either in the script, uh, script which we use uh, today, or in the Palo Hebrew, which was used at the first temple time. We have also cryptic texts, uh, Greek, Aramaic, and other languages. The other languages are mostly from the later period. So to summarize what we've seen until now, we have over 1,000 uh, manuscripts. Um, all these manuscripts are divided into about 25,000 fragments, where the oldest one is from the 7th century BCE. It was found in the Vadi Murabat. It's from the first uh, temple time. And our latest is from the 12th century uh, CE, also found in the same cave in Murabat. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how the scrolls were found and how they were brought uh, here to us. Our first connection with these ancient manuscripts was in the winter of 1946 uh, to 47. The tale says that these two Bedouin cousins from the Tamira tribe uh, walked a flock of, uh, they, heard, they herded the goats on the cliff of uh, the Dead Sea near the site of Qumran, when one of the goats stumbled into this opening of the cave. They did not go into the cave, they threw a stone inside and they heard, started raining, uh, the sound of the pottery breaking. They were afraid to go into the cave uh, to uh, get the goat out, so they went back to the tribe and a few days later they walked in with some backup. Uh, this is the entrance of uh, this cave. We call it today uh, cave one of Qumran, and they, they find seven scrolls rolled up in linen and placed inside these clay jars on the floor. There are a lot of different versions to the story. Um, I guess you will never know really what happened, uh, but this is usually the version that, uh, um, that we go with and, with and makes the most sense. The two cousins uh, split the first one took four scrolls, the ones you could see here above, to a dealer in Bethlehem, which was also a shoemaker. In the beginning, they wanted to sell. They had no idea what they stumbled upon. Uh, they thought it was something modern. They thought perhaps it was something uh, Syriac, maybe 100 or 200 years ago. I don't think they ever imagined that they found one of the most important archaeological finds of the 20th century. They, they, they brought it to, they couldn't, they couldn't even sell it in the beginning. They even showed it to some uh, Hebrew scholars who told them that it's either fake or modern. Uh, eventually, the first um, person that was, uh, that was willing to, uh, to sell it was the guy here uh, circled in red, uh, named Kando. Um, apart from being a, a shoemaker, he was also an uh, antiquities um, dealer. And he agreed to be the middleman in a transaction and bring it to the monastery in East Jerusalem uh, of the Syriac church. The church bought these four scroll, scrolls for about 28 uh, Jordanian miras. Uh, as you could, today it's you know, worth uh, a lot uh, more, you can imagine. I have a short video over here. Oh, wait one second. Um, the head of the church did not know what to do uh, with what he stumbled upon. So he brought it to the American School of Oriental Research in East uh, Jerusalem uh, to a scholar called, called William Brownlee to take a look at it. You could see how they, how they received uh, the scrolls, you know, you can roll them and unroll them as they please. Luckily for us, uh, the scholars over there had a, a video camera, which was very rare uh, at that time. 
and this is the role that that's as well. The other three scrolls were sold, uh, were taken to Professor Eliezer Sukenik from the Hebrew University. Um, he was an archaeologist that worked on the, on the Second Temple burial caves. A lot of these burial caves have writings on it. So when his friend, uh, also he sold it to a friend, his friend called him up uh, to tell him that he thinks he has something that he'll be very interested in. Uh, but because it was Bethlehem and he couldn't uh, cross the border to get that, they met uh, on the border between uh, East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. And through uh, the wires, he passed him one uh, fragment. And at that instant, uh, Professor Sukenik realizes that what he's holding is, is an ancient uh, Jewish biblical manuscript. And he recognized the writings the, to be identical to the uh, writings that he finds in these burial caves um, on the tombs. Professor Sukenik uh, risks his life, and a day before, um, a day before the declaration of independence, he goes over to Bethlehem and takes by these three scrolls for thirty-two Jordanian liras and brings them into uh, West uh, Jerusalem to his house in Rechavia. In 1954, um, the fourth course that with, they were with the uh, church, uh, take, they, they were taken out of Israel already in the 50s, more probably in 49, into the United States. After four or five years, the head of the church decided that he cannot, he does not want to work with the scrolls anymore, anymore. In the beginning, he would exhibit, he would put them in exhibitions, and after after a few years, he decides to sell them. And back then, they would sell uh, everything on the newspaper under the miscellaneous sale, um, and he offers any educational or religious institution to buy these uh, four Dead Sea Scrolls for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Professor Sukenik knew uh, about these four scrolls, but he was not able to get his hands on them. And he, he lived um, uh, his life thinking that he missed the opportunity and that they were lost uh, forever. Uh, after This is after uh, he died. His son, Ingael Yadin, also an archaeologist and a general in the army, was in the United States when this um, I ad was published, and a friend showed him and told him, "You have to, uh, you have to look at this. You have to do something uh, with this information." And he contact he gets a, a, a funding and a donation actually, and through a middleman, he manages to buy these four uh, scrolls and bring them back to uh, to Jerusalem and reunite them with the three scrolls that his father uh, bought uh, less than uh, 10 years before. Now, why a middleman? Because the church did not want to sell uh, the scrolls to, to the Israelis. So he had to um, do everything differently. And they bring it in the beginning to, to Israel. In the beginning, it was in the uh, National Library. And in the 60s, they, bought, they built the Shrine of the Book in the Israel Museum, where they are still housed today. Now, the, um, the scholars, it took them a while to realize uh, what they have here in the hands. And in April uh, 48, it was already published uh, that something very uh, uh, important and exciting was found in the desert. Of 
So everyone is getting very excited about this new find. Uh, the, Rockefeller, the Rockefeller Museum um, with the place of the, where the British uh, Antiquities Department uh, was. And together with, uh, uh, together with the archeologists of the Ecole Biblique and the Jordanian Department of Antiquities, everyone went back to the desert to see what they can find. They have uh, realized that if the skull, if these seven skulls were found there, perhaps there's more. And the once they went into the desert to look for more, the Bedouins realized that there's a lot of money in stake over here. And that these crazy archeologists um, are willing to pay a lot for what seems, looks to them as just uh, dirty uh, pieces of, of parchment. So everyone kind of runs back into the desert, uh, into the Jordanian desert, and looks for more. The years of the survey was from 49 until 56, when in the year 1952, uh, the cave of Qumran uh, was discovered. It was first discovered by the Bedouins and then by the archaeologists. And this is the cave that yielded the most fragments. Almost 600 manuscripts uh, came from this cave over here. It's kind of small today, you can't even enter because it's uh, there's a danger of collapsing, but up, up until a few years ago, you could still uh, go in and see. And it looks different than the other caves that uh, we've seen before. It's a much uh, thinner um, uh, ground, more like uh, dust, and the fragments were kind of scattered all on the floor, unlike the first skulls that we've seen before that were uh, intact uh, inside these jars. The, the Bedouins, bring everything they found to the Rockefeller Museum and sell it to the same archeologists uh, that are in, in the field. And the archeologists also bring them into the Rockefeller Museum. They come in uh, dirty, uh, torn, uh, and filthy. The first team of researchers uh, was composed of about eight uh, scholars and their job was to take all these fragments and start sorting them out and figuring out what's, you know, what's written on them. Um, in the first few years, they were, you know, every few fragments that they kind of figured might be related to one another, maybe it came from the same skull. They put on tape on the back. You can see the tape over here, adhesive tape, uh, which was a new invention then. Uh, and they put them on a glass plate. You can see here some more images of how these fragments arrived into the Rockefeller Museum, all in boxes and shoe boxes, cigarettes, uh, film, anything they had. It took them uh, many years to sort all these fragments out. In the end, they, they, they uh, divided all these thousands of fragments into 1,000 261 plates, which plate is a physical object that can have a few fragments on it. And um, they realized it belongs to over 960 manuscripts. Luckily for us, before they closed uh, the glass plate, they took images of these uh, fragments with the infrared uh, technology. They had a very talented photographer called Najib Anton Albina that built a studio inside the Rockefeller uh, Museum. And with the help of the infrared, he was able to take out uh, uh, the carbon-based ink, uh, even when you couldn't see anything, um, um, when, when, even when it's not visible in the naked eye, the infrared is able to make the ink darker and the parchment um, lighter. They started working on the publication of these uh, fragments. Up until 1953, they, they published, uh, I think, about uh, six uh, uh, volumes of what we call today the DGD. That's the Discoveries of the Judean Desert, the official publication. In 67, in the Sixty War, in Israel, on June uh, 5th, uh, the soldiers walk into the Rockefeller Museum after a battle, and East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem is reunited. Everything that was in 
the, uh, the Department of the Jordanian Antiquities at the time moved to the hands of the Israeli Department of Antiquities, including the scrolls. In the 1970s, they tried um, sending them for co some conservation in the Israel uh, Museum, a conservation laboratory. Uh, without a lot of luck, the fragments, you know, are 2,000 years old, like I said. They suffered from gelatinization. They suffered from a lot of mishandling through the years unintentionally, of course. Uh, putting them in between these glass plates suffocated to them. It's organic material that needs to breathe. And a lot of damage uh, was done uh, over the years. And even from the 70s uh, onward, uh, conservatives have been trying to reduce some of the damage and, and conserve the school for, for future uh, generations. In 1991, the Israel Antiquities Authority was established. The, uh, the head of the Israel Antiquities Authority, Amir Dori, back then, made the two very, very important um, made very, very, two very important uh, uh, decisions about the future of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The first one was the conservation. He said, um, if we do not have the, the fragments, then we do not have anything. And we have to take care of the fragments. Um, you know, it's, it's our first and most important cause. The second decision he made was regarding the publication. A lot of scholars, you know, this is already 40 years after, and after over 40 years after the scrolls were found, and little, little was known about them. Most of the scholars had no access to what's written in them, and they were feeding off of rumors and, uh, uh, and images that were stolen uh, from outside. Uh, the first scholars did not give access to anyone who was not on their team. They wanted to publish uh, the scrolls at uh, their um, uh, pace. In 1991, he said, enough is enough. And he gave the project to Professor Emmanuel Tov from the Hebrew University. And he told him that he had 10 years to publish all the material. If he cannot publish it in 10 years, then the job will go to someone else who perhaps can. Professor Emmanuel Tov from the Hebrew University had over 100 scholars and students. And in 10 years, in 2001, uh, the publication was finished. It, we call the Judanian, the discovery of the Judanian desert. We have it in every uh, in every university and a big library. And today, every scholar wants to know uh, what is written in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, translations, transcriptions, and a lot of uh, other information you can go into one of these volumes and find what he needs to find. And ne next week, um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Elite of Freecorn, will talk about the conservation and the efforts that we're doing today to maintain the scrolls for prosperity. Um, the digitization project uh, was led by uh, Dr. Tamina Shor from the Israel Antiquities Authority. She uh, initiated this unit and also the digitization team uh, project with funds from the Arcadia uh, Fund and the Leon Levy Foundation. The first and most important goal of the project was to find a scientific way to monitor the physical state of the, of the fragments without causing them any damage. The second cause was um, to digitize them and document the fragments as they are today and to, um, uh, and to make them accessible uh, to the public. The first thing we did is we started with scanning those PAM negatives that I showed you uh, before. They were imaged in the 1950s in the Rockefeller Museum. Because they, 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 um, the, the PAM negatives uh, um, document the fragments as they arrived before they deteriorated further by uh, the human handling that uh, uh, came uh, with the scholars. So the first thing we did is we scanned all these uh, negatives. And the second thing we did is we bought a, a designated system to image each one of these fragments. 
We started the digitization project in 2010. In 2011, we started imaging the fragments. We image each fragment separately in 28 different wavelengths in, in exposures and in 12 different wavelengths. So we image it also in the um, visible spectrum that we see uh, in, with our naked eye, and also in the infrared spectrum that, like I said before, brings out uh, the text and makes the uh, surface, um, the background, much brighter. And I will show you what it looks like. So on your left, uh, you can see the numbers, uh, uh, the nanometer climb higher. And as it climbs higher, the text uh, becomes more and more visible. And in the end, we take all the wave, all the uh, uh, exposures in the visible wavelength and we put it together into one colorful image that looks exactly like uh, the physical fragment itself. Um, for those of you who can read Hebrew, you can try and see what it says over here. Bereshit bara Elohim, et ha-shamayim ve-et ha-aretz, v'ruach Elohim merechefet et pnei ha-mayim. This is the first chapter of uh, Genesis. Heaven, once we um, knew that we were going to digitize all these uh, fragments, um, we got contacted by uh, Google, who was working on a platform for cultural heritage. Uh, they contacted uh, us, um, you know, saying that if we have these images, then they are uh, willing to put them online and build a digital uh, library for us. And in, 2000, in the end of 2012, we went uh, online with we had in the beginning almost 5,000 images. Today, we have over 30,000 images online um, divided into categories. And each one of you can go in. And I advise you to go in and uh, look at our website and uh, search and learn more about anything that interests you. We have today over 18,000 users a month. Uh, which is an exposure that the scrolls have never seen before. Most of the people who use our site today are not scholars. We do not have 18,000 uh, scrolls uh, scholars over the world. It's mostly people who are just interested and want to learn more and uh, explore the scrolls by themselves. The digitization project uh, had a lot of outcomes that we've, we haven't even imagined. It brought you a lot of public interest and involvement. Um, we were able to put up virtual exhibitions and a lot of new readings and interpretations started emerging because scholars for now do not have to go into the uh, official publication. They do not even need to come into our laboratory to look at the fragments themselves. They could sit down on the home computer and, and see uh, the infrared images like they haven't seen uh, before. So this brought up a lot of new research on the school. I will show you another video. So you can see why the infrared is so important to us and why it has changed in a scholarly world. Usually when you think about a scroll, I'm assuming this is more or less what you uh, think about and not the small fragments uh, that you've seen. This uh, uh, scroll is from uh, um, Cave 11 in Qumran. Now, if you look at the bottom, the wavy bottom, it's not a burnt, but it was most probably rolled up and stuck in the ground and the humidity uh, ate through the parchment and it went through a process which we call a uh, gelatinization. So you can, if you look uh, at the same bottom, you can see how from black, it turned into a white and writings that you cannot see uh, before you could see now. 
This is the Book of Psalms. We have about 48 uh, hymns that were conserved in this uh, uh, manuscript. We've also had a lot of, of uh, you know, today there's a whole field of the uh, digital humanities that we try to use uh, the sciences for the benefit of uh, of the humanities to learn more about what we have. So there are a lot. Of, so with the digitization project, um, this all became possible. So we have um, uh, teams in. Germany and Holland and in Israel and in other places around the world that use our images to learn about who wrote the scrolls and to try and find matchings between different fragments from different places and a lot of uh, other very impressive stuff that we're doing. We're working today on building a uh, um, on a project with uh, Gettingen in Germany and the University of Haifa and uh, Tel Aviv to make a virtual environment uh, for the scholar where, can, where he can actually take the fragments and place them together and look at the transcription at the same time and create his own kind of digital uh, edition of a manuscript. Uh, we hope that it will go online in the next uh, few months. Another thing that the digitization project has brought us is the uh, new readings. Uh, like I said, a lot of these boxes that may that you know scholars in the first kind of tagged them as you know small fragments that uh, uh, that are too small to be identified. Uh, with the help of the technology, we can look at the fragments again and identify them and place them together with manuscripts that we already know. This is one example, but we have a few others. This is also Psalms. It's part of the same manuscript I showed you before. And you can see how it all fits in together. Apart from the uh, infrared technology, we use other, uh, we use everything that is non-destructive, that will not uh, bring, do any harm to the scroll and might give us some, uh, um, some uh, usage and some answers uh, to questions. We've done a micro CT on a few um, of our artifacts. Some uh, haven't given any uh, good results and some it has. And we will show, I will show you here. sectional images that show the internal structure of the scroll. When viewed as a 3D object, one can clearly see the individual layers of the scroll, but any text on the surface of those layers is obscured from view. In order for a readable version of the scroll to be produced, these images must be passed through our virtual unwrapping pipeline. First, we capture the 3D shape of the layers of the scroll in a process called segmentation. On the left side of the screen, the software moves through the scroll, image by image, tracing the shape of a single scroll wrap. On the right, we see the 3D model that this produces. Next, we extract the ink from the data in a process called texturing. Using the 3D shape generated by segmentation, our software makes another pass through the scroll, this time looking for very bright pixels. Bright pixels indicate regions of dense material, in this case, inks made with iron or lead. We now have a single wrap of the scroll with the text shown clearly on its surface. However, because the surface is curved, it's difficult to read all of the text from one viewpoint. The flattening stage of our pipeline converts this textured 3D surface into a flat plane so that the text can be more easily read. To produce the best results, these three steps must be performed on one small section of the scroll at a time. As a result, we end up with several textured images that must be merged together. This merging process creates a single consolidated image that shows the full text. So what you see, what you saw over here on the video um, is a, a piece of burnt scroll found in the synagogue, in the ancient synagogue of En Gedi. It's a bit later than most of the um, 
scrolls that we have is dated to the third or fourth century CE. So the ink already has some iron, apparently, it has some iron gall in it. So the micro CT was able to differentiate between the density of the ink to the density um, of the background around it. And what we found over here is the first two chapters of the book of Leviticus. So even though it's not, you know, part of the um, of our main uh, collection, um, this um, apart from the from the surprising uh, technology that was able to to uh, to give us uh, answers, even though you, we cannot see anything there with the eye, of course, we did not touch the fragment itself. It's still uh, unrolled. It's all a uh, uh, virtual, but it fits in nicely um, between the biblical uh, manuscripts of the of Qumran to the much uh, later ones. So this piece of Engedi kind of uh, you know, fits in the middle, and it's identical to the Mesolithic uh, text that we have today. We have a lot of other projects. We're always trying to better our understanding and to find more and more uh, answers and possibilities, seeking other technologies uh, to help us uh, at this. We can, uh, okay. um, that's uh, my lecture. Um, next week, we're going to have uh, Dr. Elit Cohen uh, talking about the conservation. And the week after, uh, Dr. Oren Abelman will talk about who wrote uh, the Dead Sea Scroll. So you should join. It'll, it'll be interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orit, for taking us also to the history and to see these technologies, which I find fascinating. And we have a few questions from the audience, and I'd like to try and run some of them by you. Um, okay, Yonit Schiller, hey Yonit, wanted to know if were some of the scrolls intentionally ripped by the Bedouins who hope to make their find more lucrative? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, yes. Um, they, would, they would get uh, paid uh, according to, to peace in the beginning, so it's logical that they would just tear it up and sell more pieces. When the scholars realized it, they started uh, um, uh, giving money you know, per length, mm -hmm. per inch, and not per fragment. So we were kind of lucky that they stopped it at a good time. Yeah, shame. Another question regarding the finding of the scroll. What was the reason for the animal urine on the scroll? Was that because there were animals around or was there a purpose for that? So I, the, the, in cave 11, there's a lot of uh, cat, uh, bat uh, dung. But apart from that, uh, it's not animal urine what you see. What, what you, you, I, may, I think you're relating to the dark areas of the uh, skull that we saw. It's not animal urine. It's the humidity uh, from the ground that ate through the parchment and uh, went, it went through gelatinization. The only way to stop uh, the deterioration of the skulls is to keep uh, the, the right conditions for them, the humidity, the temperature, and light exposure. And those three things are the only things that can stop uh, the deterioration of the skull. It's an organic material. Yeah. We, all, uh, <laughs> we all age. True. So Joanna Ash says she reads and speaks Hebrew, but when she looks at the scrolls, even the biblical one, there are often letters that aren't familiar. Is this a different font or what is it actually written in? So it is a different font. Um, in one of my slides, I showed the, the different scripts that were used. One of the scripts is the ancient Hebrew uh, one. There was uh, in the use in the first temple times, 500, 600 years before these scrolls were even written. But apparently they kept the, uh, the script as a sacred uh, writing, and they kept on writing it uh, for, for some of the religious uh, biblical scrolls. We have about 20 of them, um, 25, mostly from the first five books of the Moses, uh, from the Pentateuch. And we also have a few uh, scrolls, especially the ones from Psalms, even the one in Greek from uh, Nachal Hever, um, that they write the name of God in the ancient Hebrew, Hebrew script. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the same script we have today on our coins. 
So there's a, you can see the line between the first temple time, you know, through the scrolls and through the Bar Kochva revolt where they try to revive the same script. And today we use it again in the, in the money. Okay, I think we'll take two more questions. Could you talk a bit about the fact that the scrolls were held, kept from scholars, and it was forbidden to publish them for many years? Yeah, that, that's kind of juicy. <laughs> um, there were a lot of them. Um, uh, well, scholars do that all the time. But at, at, at the, for a certain, um, uh, it's legitimate, you know, for a certain period of time. After that, it becomes unlegitimate. Even today, uh, an archaeologist has a few years to publish the material. Only if he cannot do it he, after five years, he can get uh, 10 years. And after 10 years, it goes to uh, someone else. Um, in the beginning, there were also a lot of uh, um, conspiracies that the other, not only scholars, but everyone wanted to know what's written in the scrolls. Uh, everyone was interested uh, in it, and there were a lot of conspiracies as why they do not want to tell us. Is it because uh, you know it says that Jesus here or Jesus that? Um, is it because they found something that's uh, you know too too big and important that they do not want to share it uh, with anyone else? But the truth is, it was only because of political reasons. Uh, they did not even have the, the right manpower or enough budget to publish uh, everything. And for political reasons, they did not, they did not want to open it to other scholars uh, to come in. Okay. Were any unique version of any other biblical text found anywhere else in the world or just here in the Dead Sea region? So, yeah, yes. And uh, we do know about other... A biblical versions. Um, there's the Targum uh, Shivim, it's the Greek a translation of uh, the Bible, which is different than the Masoretic text uh, that we have today. The ancient uh, Egyptian, um, there's an ancient Egyptian text, and there are others. The scrolls are dated just before uh, the text was 100% closed. So some of them are very, very similar to what we have. Some of them are similar to other versions we have. And some of them are kind of in between, not here and not there. They're a mixture of, of all these different versions. 